I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover in 90 minutes. Uh, I actually uh, normally do this in a two hour presentation. So the pace, is, the pace will be fast and furious. Um, and uh, wanted to just um, let you know that we're gonna be uh, sending you this presentation afterwards. Um, so don't feel like you have to take notes along the way, uh, but uh, buckle up and uh, here we go. So welcome to the BizHack Live webinar series. My name is Dan Gretsch and I'm the founder of BizHack Academy. Every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. we do master classes and uh, instructional live tutorials on digital marketing for small businesses. Uh, you can follow us at BizHack Academy uh, and you can use the hashtag BizHack Live uh, on social media. It's great to have you here today. So today uh, we're going to be talking about my signature presentation, the five pillars of digital success for small businesses. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, we have a great lineup coming up. Um, next week we're going to be having our digital marketers graduation celebration. Um, those of you who are interested in our five-week course I definitely recommend you go to this. You can see what the end product is of the five-week accelerated course and, and how it, uh, how uh, different business owners use what they they learn to run actual digital campaigns and drive leads and sales to their business. So that's next Wednesday, at twelve thirty. We're going to be graduating our thirteenth cohort of BizHack. They're called the COVIDs, uh, appropriately. That's what the name they gave themselves. In two weeks, we're gonna, uh, we've done a lot of surveying and the number one response that people say is that they're looking to pivot their business and their career. And uh, this is gonna be an invaluable session with Jennifer Hudson about telling you where to pivot by starting with your core values and investigating your core values and then using that to pivot. And then in three weeks, uh, we're gonna do our first ever industry deep dive um, there is an extraordinary uh, case study in the Related Group, which is one of the largest real estate development companies in the world. They do new product, new buildings, as well as leases. Um, and uh, Allison Goldberg, who is their head of marketing, um, has an incredible story to tell about how their business pivoted uh, it, to virtual leases uh, in a matter of uh, a week and how they were able to recover from a near complete shutdown of their business to one of their best weeks ever in May. So it's a really amazing story of how to, like getting in the trenches of how you ex execute a pivot in real time by one of the top companies in South Florida. Related Group is owned by George Perez, who as you know, endowed the museum, the art museum. So very much encourage you to come to that. Uh, as in three weeks. Uh, you'll get a follow-up email with the links to RSVP to these three events and really uh, hope to see you guys there. So I think a lot of you already know me, but my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder of BizHack uh, Academy. BizHack is uh, one of the, um, was named one of the top startups in 2019 by the Miami Herald because of the work that we do helping small businesses grow. We really work hard on digital lead generation. Um, in other words, helping you as a business learn how to drive leads and sales to your business. And today we're gonna to be talking about the fundamentals, the basics of how to do that. Um, and we're gonna use Facebook as a uh, platform to help us get to bigger ideas in digital marketing. So we're gonna kind of really uh, anchor ourselves in the Facebook advertising platform, but really the messages, uh, the, the lessons here apply to any campaign, organic or paid, Facebook or Google, that you might want to do digitally. I wanted to uh, take a minute in this moment that we're living in to talk about um, BizHack and how it's supporting the Black community uh, in Miami and nationally and internationally. Uh, an extraordinary 87% of the people that we train are entrepreneurs of color, business owners of color, um, 
professionals of color, and uh, this is black and brown, Hispanic and African American. I myself uh, am Hispanic. I come from an uh, immigrant family from Spain, uh, and I am uh, uh, BizHack itself is an MBE, a minority business enterprise. Uh, but more importantly, we've partnered with 25 plus business support organizations, including many that assist MBEs. And you can see some of the pictures of some of the uh, entrepreneurs of color that we've trained over the years. Uh, and these are a list of just some of the partners. Um, we wanted to highlight those that actually uh, in, focus their support on people of color and the underprivileged. Uh, I just finished uh, 30 minutes ago doing a, um, a free presentation to the Florida State Minority Supplier Development Company um, Corporation. Um, after this, I'm going to be doing a free presentation to the Greater Kendall Business Association, which is heavily Hispanic. Uh, we've worked very closely with Miami Bayside Foundation as one of their lead instructors, Lilia, who works with me at BizHack and I both do that. Urban League of Broward County, Hispanic Unity, Haitian American Chamber of Commerce, the Opalaka CDC, all of these are organizations where BizHack has done free training uh, for uh, entrepreneurs of color and business owners. We also are partners with the three largest educational institutions in South Florida, Miami-Dade College, Broward College, and FIU, and we work with the SBDC as well. Um, Miami-Dade College, which is where BizHack originated, we piloted for three years at the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College. We were then called Market Hack. Miami-Dade College is the largest educator of brown or black and black folk in the world, and it is with incredible pride that our roots come from an institution like that and the values that Miami-Dade College has, which is to bring education and access to a more diverse and inclusive group of people is absolutely aligned with what we are trying to do here at BizHack. But words and partnerships are not enough. And so today I'm very proud to announce for the first time publicly that we're formally launching a scholarship program for entrepreneurs of color for our upcoming five week accelerated program. We've, we've set aside a scholarship fund of more than $20,000, which are gonna help support <coughs> uh, minority owned business owners and professionals of color to be able to take our course in a more affordable way. Um, if you're interested in learning more uh, or applying, I recommend you put in the application, it's really short, at try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. We're gonna have as part of the process a mandatory info session, which will answer all of your questions. Uh, so again, it's try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. Uh, Lilia, if you could put that link in the chat with the HTTPS so that it's clickable. Um, folks uh, would love those of you who are uh, MBEs or um, professionals of color, people of color, uh, to, to please apply. We want to uh, have you fill up our class. This current cohort that we're running right now is more than half black. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, of the 10,000 businesses that we've trained over the last five years, 87%, 87% are people of color. Uh, this is one of the great blessings uh, of being in Miami um, and of being, um, you know, in a place as diverse as ours. Uh, the, the people uh, of color, the minority-owned businesses, are the strength and the innovation in this country. Um, and um, uh, we at BizHack stand uh, firmly uh, in support of you and are putting our money where our mouth is. Um, I uh, wanted to also mention that we're going to be sending an email uh, to our community list this afternoon, uh, talking about BizHack's stance uh, in support of people of color and the black community and announcing this scholarship. So if you're interested, apply now, because it is first come, first serve, and there are limited seats in the class and limited funds available. Um, we're going to try to get in as many folks as possible. One other quick note is the course is by application. And so there is an application process once you get into the course, and we turn away about half of the applicants, um, once you get into the course, then the scholarship would apply. So this scholarship application is also an application for the course. Really encourage you to take the time to fill it out. And with that, uh, let's get started. So before we make any conversation about digital marketing and how to market, 
uh, we need to take a second and reflect on how marketing has changed uh, because of COVID-19, because it has changed fundamentally, and I would argue permanently. So this is research that was done by WordStream about Google searches. Google searches, as we're gonna talk about a little later when we talk about behavioral targeting, Google searches are a really great way for you to figure out what people are interested in, what people want, and what people are looking for. And according to searches in Google, the, the folks who are under the good category are those industries that have actually seen an uptick in traffic and interest due to COVID. So the economic devastation from COVID is widespread, but it is uneven. And there are some industries that are actually thriving, and many of those are included on this list. And it's kind of amazing that just from looking at Google search traffic, you can actually intuit and interpret uh, such rich data. So some of the people who have actually seen an increase in traffic and lower cost of conversions for their ads are nonprofits and charities. People are in a donating mood. Health and medical. Uh, that's not entirely surprising because uh, a lot of because uh, this is a health crisis after all. Business management. So a lot of small businesses are imperiled. Companies that help small businesses, companies like mine, uh, have actually seen uh, brighter pastures in part by COVID. Finance. So a lot of us are conserving cash among our, our business owners. Cash is king. Uh, running out of cash is the way you fall out of, uh, as you go out of business. So since we're all conserving cash, those people who provide financial expertise and financial services like banks are actually doing very well. Beauty and personal care. Since we can't go to the spa or the hair salon, a lot of folks are now doing uh, their own uh, self-care at home. On-demand media like Netflix and Amazon Prime Video um, has seen a, just an explosion. I'm sure all of us are consuming on-demand media a lot more than we used to. And then greetings, gifts, and flowers, um, sending our condolences or just sending birthday wishes. Those areas have seen a lot more traffic. If you fit into one of those categories and you have not seen a jump in traffic and engagement, that probably is a signal that you're not doing something right on digital platforms. And you really need what I'm about to talk about in this course, in this uh, webinar. All right, now the bad, these tend to be larger purchases. People are holding off on spending large amounts of money. So that's real estate, home improvement, home furniture, automotive, retail. Uh, a lot of stores are closed, so a lot of retail outlets are doing badly. And we've seen a wave of bankruptcies of major retailers like um, J. Crew and Neiman Marcus. Um, jobs in education, you know, the job uh, market, though it saw a little bit of an uptick, has been really dead. Um, is uh, businesses can serve cash, uh, furlough employees, and kind of hold on to see what's next because there's so much uncertainty. And then legal services. Now there's some legal services like divorce attorneys that are doing great. I'm just kidding, I don't know if that's true, but you can imagine. There are others like um, uh, Juana Bethel's husband who has a practice. Juana Bethel is a graduate of BizHack and has done a lot of her work in community management. Her husband um, runs a law firm for people in car accidents. And well, if you're not driving, you're not getting into car accidents. So he said he has started to see an increase uh, in customers um, uh, for his practice. Not ideal, because it means they're getting into accidents, but it does signal that um, for him, things shut down. So depending on which aspect of legal services, you might see different results. And then the ugly. I mean, I honestly don't know how the cruise industry is gonna recover from this. Um, you know, bars and restaurants are gonna have a lot of trouble if they're at 50% capacity. Conferences, live entertainment, sporting events, uh, any event. Um, these are gonna be really troubled industries and industries where pivots and really creative business modeling is gonna be necessary in order to survive. So um, I, I definitely feel like um, if you're in the ugly category, uh, you need to be really thinking creatively about how to serve your audience and how to leverage your assets uh, because it's going to be really difficult um, to do business as usual and survive. Now, we're going to talk about behavioral marketing a little bit later, but I wanted to take a second and talk about how web behavior has changed. Internet usage due to COVID-19 has skyrocketed. Why? Because people are at home and they're bored. It makes sense. But one of the things that we're seeing for the first time ever is we used to see really big spikes in, in website traffic during the week and then troughs during the weekend. And so it, 
almost every website had this kind of, you know, curve that would look like a sine curve or a cosine curve. Now what you can, and you can see that the red curve, which is last year's traffic numbers, this is from Tandem Interactive, a great local agency. You can see how there's like big dips and you can tell where the weekends are. What we're seeing now in the yellow circled areas is how the weekends are flattening out. And what that means is more people are online on the weekends because they don't have anywhere to go. And the weekends are starting to look more like the weekdays. And that's, that's a very big shift. And it means that you can get more done business-wise, lead generation-wise over the weekends than you used to be able to. More people are on desktop than used to be. Mobile is still the majority of users. Mobile is still king. But desktop, which is like using a laptop, when you're at home and you're not on the go, you tend to use your laptop to surf the web. And so that explains that. And then later morning starts when you don't have to take your kids to school, you don't have to show up at work at a certain time and have a commute that you have to fight through. The day starts later, the night goes later as well. So we're starting to see a shift to more traffic in the late morning and later at night. So what's really cool is you can almost like look at web traffic and start to get a picture of how life at home has changed. And that's really one of the powerful things about behavioral targeting and digital data is it can tell you a heck of a lot about your target audience just by looking at things as simple as when traffic is coming to your website. At the same time as all this is happening, social media has exploded. We have seen an explosion of usage of Facebook and Instagram, and many of us have discovered TikTok over this uh, COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, Instagram engagement is up by more than 70%. Facebook, time spent on Facebook is up by 70%. Messaging, uh, communicating using Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, as opposed to, say, text message, is up by 50%. And this is really important because messaging can be a really great tool to communicate with potential customers. Also, to get people to go from Facebook to your website is up by 50%. This is huge. The reason for this is simple. When you're out and about, it takes a long time for a website to render on your phone and you get impatient and you shut it down. When you're in a Wi-Fi environment at your home, it's faster and so more people are clicking through to websites. This is absolutely what you want as a business owner is you want people to go from your Facebook ad, from your Facebook post to your website. That's a much more useful thing. And so to have website traffic go up is great. All this is happening at a time when advertising on social media is plunged. And this is because all of those businesses, they're out of business, can't advertise on social media. They're not in business right now. So restaurants and retail shops, they've cut their ad spend. A lot of others feel it's not an appropriate time to advertise. So if you do advertise on Facebook, remember there are more eyeballs. That's what all those other stats were about. And less advertising money. So that means much lower advertising rates. So the rates on, ad on Facebook have plummeted because it's an auction. The supply of eyeballs is up. The demand by advertisers is down. And so if you have something to advertise, you can do so now more cheaply uh, than probably you'll be able to, you were able to do before and probably you'll be able to do as the economy reopens. It's not just Facebook. Stats for LinkedIn, for email open rates are, have also skyrocketed. And for those of you who are in a B2B business, B2B companies, and those businesses that have tended to rely on nose-to-nose, face-to-face networking, those businesses are rushing into digital marketing because their traditional sales channels of events and trade shows and conferences and in-person meetings and um, you know, going to uh, the weekly uh, BNI meeting or going to the Chamber of Commerce uh, meeting, all of those have shut down or become virtual and the kind of connection you can make uh, no matter how good I am on a webinar isn't the same as the kind of connection you can make in a nose-to-nose -nose interaction. But if you relied on that, that, that channel is shut down for you and you gotta pivot. In the case of BizHack, we used to rely a lot on being invited by other organizations to give talks to their audiences. And I would use that as a way to grow my email list and to raise awareness of BizHack. And I used to, and I would target, you know, those two dozen business support organizations that help um, small businesses that has that basically shut down for the last three months today is the first day uh, I, some of them are inviting me back and doing it in the webinar format but they were slow to kind of take on that format 
And so part of the reason I created this webinar series is so that I could still access business owners, provide value, of course, but also um, give you guys uh, an opportunity to learn from me um, and not since I didn't, since I lost my other channel, which is outside event partners. Um, so it really caused a big marketing shift in BizHack and a different product that we're offering, which are the BizHack Live webinars. And you know, because of your amazing support uh, and for showing up week after week and telling your friends, uh, we keep doing these as a service to the community. Uh, and we're doing it as a way to say, hey, we really know what we're talking about. We bring you top level experts and top quality content. So that's a small way in which BizHack pivoted because of these stats and because of the fact that certain marketing channels for us were getting shut down. I mean, in many ways, we are a B2B business. We sell to other companies and uh, our, our traditional sales model uh, marketing channels were in peril. So today's session is we're going to talk about the five pillars of digital marketing and how to communicate using them effectively and profitably with current and future customers when you're running campaigns. We've already talked a little bit about this, how marketing has changed permanently due to the pandemic and how you can adapt. That'll be kind of underlying everything we talk about. And I'm going to give you a case study uh, of a small business that has applied our specific methodology, the five pillars, to her advertising campaign and had dramatic results. So I want to make sure that we're starting big picture, but drilling down into hyper specifics so that you can get a sense of how to actually apply this to your own business. This is a, um, you're going to get a, a link to a recording of this. You're going to get a copy of this presentation. There's a handout. My goal with you is to get you started and to give you a couple places where you can begin to leverage the five pillars of digital success. And those five pillars are the campaign objective, the target audience, the irresistible offer, strong visual, and a compelling message. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about is we have, um, we're using the, the Facebook ad as a tool, as a tool to help talk about the five pillars of digital success. So I don't want you to get confused by this point. We're drilling deep into Facebook because Facebook's platform is used by every business. It's familiar to many of you. And, the, and it's a great teaching tool to help exemplify digital best practices. And this is a technique that we have pioneered. It is a core part of our methodology and we use it very heavily in the five week course. Some people think that our course is about teaching Facebook advertising, it's not. It's about how to think like a digital marketer and then to apply that new way of thinking in the easiest platform to use, which is Facebook advertising. And so um, I wanted to just be clear about that, that the reason we're diving deep into Facebook um, is not because um, we uh, advocate Facebook or we think it's the only channel that matters, um, but because we think that Facebook is um, a incredible tool, learning tool, and we like to use it in that way. So um, I wanted to just take a second and um, Lilia, were there any questions um, that are coming from the audience? Uh, I wanted to just pause for a second uh, and see if there are any questions before we really dig in and get started. Um, just, um, well, no questions. People are asking if the recording is gonna be available. Yes, it's gonna be, uh, but no, we don't have any questions at this moment. And if you do have questions, please make sure you write them to the, on the chat. And I did want to take a second before we get started. Um, Joel Levy uh, is on the call right now. Joel is an incredible partner of BizHack. Um, he is the head of an agency called ScreenCo. And there are a number uh, of people uh, from ScreenCo who are on today's, uh, friends and family of ScreenCo who are on today's call, um, who are uh, here in support of Joel. Joel, did you want to say just a quick word welcoming them? And those of you who are part of the Screen Co. family, please go ahead and say hey in the group chat so that we know that you're there and, and to thank Joel and, and Kevin Asaraf. Uh, yes. Hi. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is a great partnership we're doing with uh, BizHack. Uh, we at Screen Co. We are a digital marketing agency specialized on, on e-commerce, especially on, on Latin American countries. 
And we we're very happy. We we're, we we're glad to partner with uh, Jan and, and Bisak in order to provide and help uh, small businesses achieve their goals uh, online. So that's thank you, Dan, for, for the intro. You know, th th thank you so much, Joel. And I, I want to just say ScreenCo is one of several partners that we have that are helping us reach entrepreneurs of color. So ScreenCo really specializes in the diaspora community from South America. ScreenCo also uh, has a lot of folks in Latin America that they're helping us bring us to. Um, we also partner with Icaba World and Hutch, um, uh, Jerome Hutchinson. Uh, Icaba World serves entrepreneurs of color. It's a networking group. Uh, we're partnered with Me Group and uh, AdWorks Bahamas uh, to expand into the Bahamas. We're using trusted partners to penetrate the communities of entrepreneurs of color, which is uh, our mission is we want to make this training accessible to more people and accessible to those who've often been shut out of it. And that's why we're making these partnerships and that's why we're um, including, um, uh, you know, the scholarship for those entrepreneurs. A uh, light of mine just went out, hopefully it'll come back. Um, all right, so we, uh, the first question that we need to answer, and this is just very basic, is what is a Facebook ad? Because a lot of people are really confused between the difference between an ad and a boosted post. And I'm here to tell you that a boosted post is completely different than an ad, and you'll understand why in a sec. So there are three ways to reach customers, organic posts, boosted posts, and ads. And everybody knows what an organic post, it's basically a status update. Now, again, we're talking about the context of your business page. So this is not a personal status update. This is a business status update. And you uh, have the ability to write a post. It's called an organic post. Why it's called organic? It's because marketers like making things like free sound more complicated. But organic just means a free post. You don't have to actually pay to reach an audience. Now the problem, which many of you have seen, experienced firsthand, is that the organic reach of posts actually has been dropping. It's not because your posts stink. It's because Facebook's algorithm has changed. In February of 2012, if you had 100 followers to your Facebook business page and you posted an organic status update, you would reach 16 people. Today, that number is two. And there is this term in Facebook called Facebook Zero, which is the phenomenon that by the time we're done, when Facebook is done with us, whenever you post on your business page, zero people will see it. What that means is Facebook has become pay to play. If, you, if you, you work so hard to get all those likes and followers and you cannot reach them unless you pay for it. And that's what a boost is. A boost is basically turning back the clock to 2012 and letting you reach people for money that you used to be able to reach for free. Now, is that effective? No, because too often organic posts aren't actually lead generating for you. Now, a lot of people come to me and they say, well, Dan, Facebook is so last year. It's really Instagram, which is where it's at. And then I say, well, who owns Instagram? And they say Facebook. And so what they do is they say, the party's on Instagram. I get all these organic followers on Instagram. I'm just going to put all my emphasis in organic posts on Instagram. Well, has anybody noticed and put it in the chat that Instagram is not coming uh, is not sharing its, um, I'm sorry, the organic posts on Instagram are not reaching as many people. Has anybody noticed that in the group? Because I can tell you that it is a huge uh, phenomenon in the digital marketing world. Eleanor Ho, um, uh, amazing uh, entrepreneur, uh, says yes. Um, Laura was asking if performing arts groups are in the ugly category. Uh, among nonprofits, yes, you are, uh, because uh, you don't have, um, uh, you know, shows to send people to. So yeah, the uh, performing arts groups are probably getting more web traffic if for their online offerings, but less revenue. Um, uh, now, Zia is saying that she uh, is still able to use Instagram to generate likes, follows, and even sales. I'm definitely not here to say that Facebook and Instagram organically are not going to generate um, sales for you. We, we have so many case studies where this is the case. Um, and in BizHack itself, 
one of the largest sales we ever got was through an organic Facebook post. What I'm saying is your reach on Instagram is going down intentionally because Facebook is changing the algorithm to make it harder for you to reach people organically and force you to pay for what you used to get for free. That's all I'm saying. And so if you want to use organic Facebook and Instagram and you don't pair it with an ad, your reach is going to continue to go down. And so that's why paying on Facebook and Instagram are so important. Now, there are all these reasons why a Facebook ad is more powerful and effective than a boosted post. The only thing that a boosted post has going for it is it's easy to deploy. You just say, add $10, it gives you a bigger audience, and you get, you, you didn't get much out of the organic post, you get a little bit more or nothing out of the Facebook, uh, the boosted post. There are definitely cases like that cute picture um, uh, that Zia posted that can actually really uh, get you more business. So that might be a post that you boost, but the, take that same budget, build an ad in Facebook Business Manager, which is a completely different part of the Facebook ecosystem, and you can make much more money in a much more targeted and effective way. And so the rest of this presentation, we're gonna be talking about Facebook paid advertising built using Facebook Business Manager. And oh, by the way, while Facebook and Instagram are completely different social networks, Facebook ads and, and Instagram ads, the only difference is a checkbox in Facebook biz Business Manager. So the advertising platform on Facebook is integrated while the advertising platform, uh, while the social media platforms are separate. So this is a, an area of confusion for a lot of people. But when you're advertising uh, on Instagram, you do it through Facebook Business Manager. Facebook Business Manager gives you access to Instagram, Facebook, Messenger. Soon it's gonna incorporate WhatsApp and these affiliated websites called Facebook Audience Network. It's a network of affiliated websites, partner websites, and of mobile apps that Facebook has basically a profit share agreement with and they sell them inventory to place Facebook ads. That is um, what a Facebook business manager lets you do. So you can advertise not, uh, uh, to, you can advertise and have those ads appear not on Facebook. They can appear in other platforms and that's what the Facebook ad is. And so I wanted to just make sure that we all uh, understand. Um, Zia asked, uh, do boosted posts have any value if your goal is just brand awareness? Yes, absolutely. And if you're Nike or you're Coca-Cola, or you're someone with a large ad budget, brand awareness, you know, the Super Bowl ad, the Facebook brand awareness ad is incredibly powerful and useful. What I say to most resource constrained small businesses is, can you afford brand awareness? Would you do better taking that money and investing it in lead generation? And if you're doing lead generation, do you need to raise awareness in order to then close them as a lead? Yes, but only in the context of a customer journey where they like watch a video and then you retarget them with the lead, lead ad. So we teach awareness advertising, but only in the context of how it can generate leads and sales for you. Um, you know, Andrea said that there is some resistance to sponsored content. Um, sponsored content is the little label that some people see uh, uh, that, that, that is labeling your posts as being um, uh, an ad. And it's just, it, it's, um, you know, some people just don't like being advertised to. Uh, but what I would say, Andrea, is this. If you follow the five pillars that I'm about to talk to of digital marketing, which is identify the right audience, give them a compelling offer, use compelling video and messaging, um, they're going to respond to it and they're going to be happy about it. Right, advertising, if it's effective, if it's reaching the right audience with a compelling offer, is something that people appreciate. So I wouldn't worry so much about the sponsored, that's really just a way of thinking yourself out uh, of advertising. Rather, I would say, how can I create an ad that is compelling, clickable, and has an offer that people would really love um, to do it? Uh, we, I got a private message from HS about how often the algorithm is altered continuously. 
Um, I know this statistic for Facebook. In the average year uh, for Google, in the average year, Google uh, adjusts um, its, its search algorithm more than uh, 500 times. So changes to the search algorithm are happening at a pace of more than once a day. I don't think Facebook changes its algorithm quite that rapidly, but I can tell you that the platform is constantly in motion, constantly dynamic. What they show you, how they show it to you, uh, what interests they target is in a constant state of refinement and flux. And there's a lot of automation, machine learning that's behind that process. So it's a continuous 24 hours a day, 365 days a year process because it's not a human process anymore. It's a machine learning and algorithmic process. So there's an algorithm changing the algorithm. Um, there's a question from Moises about whether the algorithms are, are, are the same in different parts of the world. The, um, the answer is no. In fact, there are algorithms that are specific to you um, and your interests. And so um, what makes Facebook so powerful is the customization and micro-targeting that it makes possible. There is no one Facebook. There is no one algorithm. The, they take so many factors into account, and then they create personalized experiences. My favorite example of this is Facebook engineers have the power to deploy different instances of the Facebook Business Manager platform. What this means is I will have two students sitting in a class and business manager looks completely different for one and the other. What they are doing is they are testing a different format or user experience to see if it leads me to spend more money as an advertiser. They do that all the time. Facebook is one of the most empowered sets of engineers and aggressive about testing and um, optimizing their platform to get you to engage and to get you to spend money if you're on the advertising platform. I did a whole masterclass on machine learning um, in, in digital marketing um, and inside of Facebook. And um, you know, if there's a lot of interest, I could definitely do that again for this audience as well. Uh, and there are experts out there who know a heck of a lot more about it than me. The big message I wanna send before we really dive into the anatomy of a cam digital campaign is uh, old white dude, Bruce Barton, OG ad executive, uh, said in the mid-century of last year something that Microsoft echoed in their virtual partner summit last month, which is, when times are good, you should advertise. When times are bad, you must advertise. I would love for you guys to take a second and reflect on whether you agree or disagree with that in the chat. Um, please take a minute and say, do you agree that right now is a good time to advertise? I've definitely heard from some business owners that say that it's a bad time to advertise because of the protests and they don't want to be seen as insensitive or trying to sell. Others say, oh no, uh, listen, so many people are in retreat. So many people are silent. Now's the time to get noisy. Now's the time to get loud. Now's the time to launch a weekly webinar series that I don't have time to do, but do anyway and stay up till four in the morning in preparation for it. Now is the time to innovate. Now is the time to go aggressive and to try things out and to advertise and to get out there. So it looks like um, uh, everyone is saying that yes, now is the time to, um, uh, to get out there. Eleanor, it's not contra contrasting advice. I cannot tell you how many people are silent right now. They're frozen. So the key is to not be silent, but to add value. And if we have time, I have three marketing tips and that's one of the core ones. But the idea is it's not to just talk for talking's sake. You need to go out there and talk about your business, talk about the value you provide, talk about your customers, talk about what you do, talk about the fact that you're closed, talk about the fact that you're reopening, make sure you're in communication with them, but not contributing noise but adding value and doing so from a brand-centered and mission-centered way. So I hope that makes sense. Remember, advertising is down dramatically. That's silence, okay? So there are, most businesses are not following Bruce Barton's advice. And so there is more space, right, for you to communicate. Let's talk about Blackout Tuesday a week ago. The idea there was for us white folk to shut up for a second and let black folks say something for once right? Give them the platform and the opportunity to talk. So BizHack did not post that day. 
but a lot of folks in the, uh, a lot of black folk did, and they talked about their lived experience, and there was less commotion and more, uh, their message was able to stand out. And that's what I saw during COVID, is I saw a lot of businesses stand out. We've talked about the Daily Ohm, that's a local business that did that, that elevated and tried to get out and have cut through the clutter and have increased their brand awareness because of the silence that Bruce Barton is talking about. And as Zia said, communicating more than selling, showing empathy and listening without trying to sell. Um, you know, the, the best sale right now is the no sale. Um, and to be empathetic and to, to give back and people will reward you with their business. And so my hope is, you know, and, and let's be honest, right? The scholarship is a marketing tactic, but it is a marketing tactic that comes from a mission to serve minority owned businesses and with $20,000 of real funds behind it. So, and it will help people who could not afford the course get in and it will make the course more inclusive and diverse. And yes, it will fill some seats that might not have otherwise been filled. So I consider that a win-win. And because I believe in our product, then it's also one that I can come out and market with genuine authenticity and passion. So we're gonna now dive really deep, really deep into the platform, enough of this sort of highfalutin stuff. And I'm gonna do it through the case study of an entrepreneur. Her name is Megan Hill. Megan is a former lawyer who was a very, very uh, accomplished lawyer before she took a break to raise four kids. And then when she went back to the legal profession, one of the most misogynistic professions there is, by the way, especially at the big firm level, she was basically told that they had no interest in a mother in their firm. She was offered paralegal jobs after being on a partner track before she took a break. Offensive. And she was so offended by this, she said, forget it, I'm not a lawyer anymore. My dream is to become a book editor, to help other people write books. I love writing and editing, and I see an opportunity to do a business in that. She's an old friend of mine. We uh, spoke on the phone and she asked for help. And, I, and she said, look, my problem is I don't have a website. I don't have social media. I have barely any money. How do I get started? And I said, the way you get started is with our five week program. And so what we're gonna do is as we go through the pillars, I'm gonna show you how she applied, Megan applied our methodology to her campaign. Pillar number one is the campaign objective. If you're not clear about what you're trying to do with the campaign, you cannot be successful. Now, campaign objective at a high level means what are your business goals? And I can tell you, if you're a small business, your campaign objective is really simple. Your goal has to be to generate profitable leads and sales for your business, period. Your digital efforts have to have a bottom line impact. So then you might say to someone like me, why are you running a webinar series if all of your digital efforts have to have a bottom line impact? Because I believe, and we'll find out, that some percentage of you are turned on by this training and might sign up for one of our courses. And so by giving away this awareness building community service webinar, I'm raising awareness but there is a funnel and a customer journey behind it. And you'll see that that is the key to unlocking mentally what you do online. There are too many people, and I'm talking to you right now, who post on Facebook and there's no purpose to it. You spend all this time and then you complain because you're not getting any leads or sales out of it. But then I look at your page and the posts are like Happy Mother's Day. How is a happy Mother's Day post going to get you a lead or a sale? If you serve moms on Mother's Day, give her a gift of information. Give her a gift of a discount. Give her a gift that will help you make money and also help her. Don't just say happy Mother's Day. I hate it. I hate it when people say Merry Christmas or happy Mother's Day as a business. I don't understand why they do it. And it's not what we advocate for. We advocate for lead generation. You are too busy to do anything but generate leads with your precious time. And if you can generate leads and make sales with that, then you are going to change your business 
forever. I'm on my high horse, man. I am caffeined up. I want to ask Eleanor Ho to unmute herself. I love it that you said amen. That's exactly what I wanted to hear from you. Eleanor, could you say for a second what your business is and how you um, think about lead generation using social media? Mm, good question, Dan. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, repeat the question, sorry. No problem. So Eleanor, you said amen when I said, um, you know, social media and digital marketing has to be about lead generation. And yeah. you're a very savvy marketer, Eleanor. Tell people what your business is and how you think about, just in a few words, how you think about your digital presence driving revenue. Wow, that's a big pressure question, Dan. Um, so I teach wok cooking and I also sell um, a complete wok kit so that people can succeed when they go home and, and cook um, at home. So my, uh, it's been very difficult to sell digitally online because um, I used to do a physical class and now everything is going um, online which is actually the direction that I was going to go into anyway, because um, people have so many schedule conflicts. So digital really has, is, will be, and is going to be the answer to um, resolving the physical classes. So marketing to people about that has actually been very challenging, even though um, everybody is stuck at home, I've been trying to figure out how to market my cooking classes online, offering something that's different from what I already have. I already have a physical, uh, I'm sorry, a digital class on Udemy. Um, so I don't want to repeat doing that. Right. So that's been my challenge. Perfect. Uh, you know, the lights just went off. Uh, so hopefully it'll come back, but. <laughs> Uh, that's your challenge and everybody's challenge, Eleanor. You know, so many of us, including BizHack, you know, in January, BizHack only offered in-person courses with a remote option. Now we are a fully online company. I can't believe it. It's been uh, a heck of a ride. Lilia Posos, who's on the call, uh, was there for me every step of the way and I love you for it. Um, Eleanor, let's you and I have a conversation um, so that we can talk about what I've learned from my journey of going online and anything I can do to help you. Um, but what I want to say is, uh, and Eleanor, people are asking for your social media handle and how to follow you. Eleanor is a brilliant marketer who is missing one piece, which is how to convert awareness to sales. And that's what our course and what the rest of this presentation will hopefully give you some insight in how to do. And then in addition to that, Eleanor, let's just you and I talk and I'd like to help you. Um, thank you for sharing, Eleanor, and, and I'm going to ask you to, to weigh, back in, uh, weigh in again later. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to thank you for letting me um, talk. <laughs> yeah. You're a walk star. <laughs> exactly. Her, uh, her audience here, she's at walk star. And it's like, I love the... You know, she's, Eleanor, you're a brilliant marketer. It's just a, a couple of things that you need to do and you're going to unlock the potential uh, to make a lot of money, a lot more money, frankly, uh, through the digital uh, effort. So I'm excited to help you on that journey. Thanks, Sam. Um, you're welcome. So, I mean, listen, I wanted to call Eleanor because I love Eleanor and I know her business pretty well because I follow it and I'm a wok cooker myself but also because I see in her and in so many other small businesses struggle where there is opportunity. And so that is what I just, what I live for. That's what I wake up for. It's why you feel my passion and energy because I know for so many of you, you are on the cusp of something big, but you are never gonna get there on your own. And you need a, tried, a trusted guide and whether it's me or a, a marketing agency or to go learn it on your own on Facebook or Google. I don't care, but I don't like seeing unrealized potential. And it's unrealized potential that frustrates me and motivates me to help. And uh, I hope that what I'm gonna dig into right now 
will give a, a little um, roadmap of how to take awareness, which is what Eleanor has a lot of, and convert it into leads and sales, customers. It starts, as I said, with the campaign objective, and your objective is to generate leads. Now, when you're actually running a Facebook campaign, you have to drill down deeper because you have to take people on a journey. We like to say at BizHack that you don't ask people to marry you on their first date, right? You gotta get to know them first. It would be super awkward if you met somebody on Match.com, invite them to a coffee at Starbucks, and then three minutes after meeting them, get on a knee and give them a ring, right? It's obvious that you don't do that, yet so many of you are selling at first contact. It's like, what do you think? Do you think the digital world is somehow different than the real world? No. Don't try to get married on the first date. You need a flow, a campaign customer journey that uh, you map out that goes from watching one of Eleanor's videos on YouTube about how to walk cook or on Instagram to then liking her page to then sending her a DM to then hiring her to uh, or, or enrolling in her Udemy course to then uh, actually hiring her to consult with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Right, that is a customer journey, and it all started with them watching a video of hers that she gave for free on YouTube or Instagram. We strongly recommend that you start with the video views objective. It's right there in the consideration. You create a video and you get people to watch it. Why start there? Because it's the cheapest ad objective there is. Once they've watched the video, you can then take the people who watched the video all the way through and retarget them with another ad that tries to get them to go to your website, that's traffic, tries to get them to fill out a form, that's lead generation, or tries to get them to message you, that's the messages. That's all you gotta do. That is how you can unlock Facebook. You do a video views ad, and then you do a retargeted ad of the video viewers that tries to get them to give you their contact information. So if you're driving traffic to your website, it's a website with a form, a landing page, not just any place in your website. So those are our recommended objectives. And I wanted you to know that I contacted Facebook and validated this approach with them. Though they do not teach it this way, this is the way to get started on Facebook if you're a small business with a constrained budget. Now, many of you have said to me, Okay, I'm running ads and I don't know if they worked. The key to knowing if an ad worked, the key to knowing if an ad worked is what your campaign objective was. So if you picked a traffic ad, you know if the ad worked if people click on the link. If you pick a video views objective, you know it worked if they watch the video called a through play, the full video called a through play. You know if it's a lead generation objective, you know the video worked, if they fill out a form. And likewise, you know if it, uh, a messages ad work if they send you start a conversation. It should become really simple once you understand the power of the campaign objective to measure the success of your ad. You now have from the very beginning what your key performance indicator is. Now, if you run a video views ad, you can't measure the success of that ad by how many people buy your product or click on the link because you were not optimizing the ad for that outcome. Facebook searches through its algorithm for the type of person who's likely to watch a video and it presents that ad to that person, not the type of person who would tend to click on a link. So when you select a campaign objective, you're almost creating a fait accompli because Facebook is then gonna optimize your ad for that objective. And so then if you then look at another performance indicator and measure the success of the ad based on that, you're kind of missing the point. So that's the importance of the campaign objective. If you set the, setting the campaign objective essentially sets the destiny of your ad. And this is true on Facebook, and this is true in every digital campaign you run, right? So if you're trying to promote an event, then your KPI is how many people RSVP and attend, and so on, right? If you're doing a Google ad, it might be to get people to your website. You have to be really clear about what you're gonna, how you're gonna measure success and then make sure that you're optimizing for that outcome. So um, Megan picked the lead generation um, ad, uh, 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 
Megan, I'm sorry, picked the lead generation um, campaign objective, which gets an email address and a phone number inside of the Facebook advertising platform. She did this as an ad that retargeted people who had originally watched her video. And so this was a second ad, a follow-up ad to people who she'd already raised awareness with. So you'll remember Megan is the one who sells book editing services. And her goal was to get people to give them her contact information. And you'll find out uh, shortly how she did that, what her offer was to compel people to do that. Uh, Lilia, did we have a question from HS? Yes, we have actually one from um, for Facebook Live uh, asking, um, I'm a B2B print local newspaper at this time that businesses are trying to step up. How can I use digital media to increase our advertising sales? And um, also another question about suggestions for an insurance agency campaign in order to be unique, discuss how to stand out from so many. Perfect. So when it, if you're a uh, newspaper that's basically selling uh, we get a lot of media companies that come through BizHack um, and spend you know, five weeks in our accelerated program trying to figure out how to provide added value to their advertisers. Um, one thing that community newspapers is doing, they were featured last week, um, is they're giving free print ads uh, to their advertisers for two months. BizHack is advertising for the first time in print because of it. And guess what? If I get good results, I'll pay happily for that ad. So that would be one approach, right? Is since you have a lot of excess inventory in your print product right now, as a lot of other advertisers have pulled back, give some of that excess inventory as a community give, but put a time limit on it and then try to convert them because uh, it's much easier for someone who's seeing results um, to come back than someone who's you're trying to sell cold for the first time. Now, if you're in the professional services field, if you're a lawyer, an insurance agent, um, an accountant, uh, all of you have the same challenge, which is it's, it's very expensive to generate leads because there's a lot of competition. And the only way that I know how to do it is through content marketing. So you have to give away information. What I'm doing right now is a form of content marketing. I'm giving you away information in a live webinar format. So that could be a way to generate leads if you're an insurance broker, right? A lot of us are wondering, shit, should I get life insurance? So maybe you start a webinar to walk people through what are the different types of life insurance, like what's term life versus whatever the other one is. You know, like it's confusing even if I, you know, I've spent hours with my insurance broker where he's just educating me about what the heck it all is. If you're good at training, if you're good at doing that, if you're good at creating white papers about that, then when it comes time to actually buy, there's a good chance that I will actually use that. Uh, Zia Frank, you have a question? You can unmute. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, about uh, giving away information. One of the things, um, I manage an acupuncture practice. Um, one of the things that we started doing um, was these Facebook Lives, and we had all of our practitioners decide, you know, what their, like, superpower was, and they did a Facebook Live of something that you can do at home, of like these stretches or these points, and um, it went over really well um, because we were also launching into telemedicine, and we were trying to generate, um, you know, booking appointments uh, through telemedicine. Um, but my question is, the biggest thing that I have always struggled with when doing Facebook ads is creating the audiences. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there because that's yeah. really what we're about to talk about. So I want to get okay. into it and make sure we have time. Thank you for sharing that. One thing I'll say is my acupuncturist, who I yeah, missed yeah. terribly, just offered me a free session. She called oh, really? me, texted me, and emailed me with a free session. Uh, this is Miami Center for Acupuncture and Chinese Medicine down on um, uh, Calle Ocho. Anyway, I think that, that was a really smart offer, right? Get me coming, get me back in the habit of coming because they know once I had one session, I'll come back for more. So just something to yeah. consider. Um, I wanted to do a quick thing. Tammy von Isakovitz um, wrote, and I love this, Tammy, because it is like such a fabulous early mistake. Um, so I'm going to um, share it with you. 
be, because I think you're thinking in a way that's very instructive. She read, she wrote, I ran a video views ad with a through play goal. I got 1.3 view, uh, thousand views, but no messages and only one like. So it was still not effective. Tammy, that ad was effective. You got through plays. You got 1,300 people to watch the video and that's what the video's campaign objective was, video views. If you wanted to get messages or you wanted to get likes, you should have picked the messages or the engagement objective and then run the same ad. So if you wanna see what I'm talking about, take the same ad, change the campaign objective and I guarantee you, you'll get more messages and likes. And then suddenly you'll say, oh, the ad was effective where it was, wasn't before and no. What I would recommend you do instead, if you're gonna spend money, is retarget those 1.3 thousand video viewers with a messages ad, with not an engagement ad, but a traffic ad. So I would definitely recommend you leverage that awareness ad that you ran that got people to watch the video and follow up with it with a compelling offer and a different objective. That's the way, that's the methodology that we recommend and why you know, it is such a common mistake to set one campaign objective and then judge the campaign a failure because it doesn't meet some other objective. This drives digital marketing agencies nuts because they're like, look, this ad was supposed to do this thing. You wanted it to do this other thing, but that's not what the ad was supposed to do. So the ad worked, but it might not have gotten you immediately to your ultimate goal, which is to get married, right? To get a new customer. And the reason why is because there's follow-ups that are required. Oh, I got your name right. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, thanks for letting me um, use you. It was such an instruct. That was honestly the best comment I've ever gotten. I'm going to borrow that because it's such a, a fabulous early misconception that really kind of grinds you to a halt. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and I hope what I said made a little bit of sense. Now, knowing your audience, the core and most fundamental and most important pillar is to know your audience. It is absolutely the crucial thing to being successful on Facebook. And the process of getting to know your audience is a process called segmentation. For example, when you look at the millennials, most of us think of what they call the hip annual, the I can make the world a better place. That actually represents the data shows less than one third of all millennials. In fact, the old school millennial and the millennial mom, the, the millennial mom with kids and the old school millennial that hates technology actually represent a larger proportion of millennials than the hip annual, which we tend to think of when we think of millennials. This is a beautiful example of the power of segmentation and how insightful it can be. All of you, all of you need to subdivide or segment your audience. And there are four ways to do it. Where they live, who they are, what they do, and why they do it. Where they live is their geography. Who they are is their age, gender, ethnicity. What they do relates back to what we were saying earlier. There are their physical behaviors and then there are their online behaviors. Remember how we saw that website traffic is flattening out? That's an example of uh, online behavior. Liking or sharing a page, watching a video, those are all behavioral targeting criteria. Do you see what I'm saying? Anything you do is a behavioral targeting criteria. And then the why you do it, the who you are, your likes and interests, your psychography, those are the psychographic factors and Facebook particularly specializes in the why you do things, the who you are. Google and Facebook have revolutionized segmentation on three and four. They have made it more powerful, more granular, and more predictive than anything that has ever come before. That is the superpower of digital marketing, and that is absolutely why all of you need to get started with digital marketing today because you have this unbelievable power at your fingertips that many of you are not utilizing. Now, there are two misconceptions that a lot of people make when they're doing their audience segmentation. Number one, 
They segment their current audience. Wrong. You want to segment your ideal mix of customers. Why would you spend money advertising to customers you hate serving? So many of us have a business where there's 5% of our clients are a pleasure and 95% are a pain. When you're advertising, you want to focus on the pleasure and you want to hyper serve the ideal customer. And there are ideal customers. There are different types of ideal customers. The work here is to think, who are my ideal customers, right? Who are the people that get explosive value from my product or service? For BizHack, it's B2C businesses in the home services or fitness uh, areas, veterinarians, doctor's offices, dentist offices. They see 100x ROI regularly with the work that we do with them. They're absolutely our ideal customer, and so I target them. That doesn't mean that I don't want to serve B2B businesses or others. It just means that those are the ones that I target with my ads, right? So B2B businesses, um, professional service providers, we give you guys great value too. You know, the sales cycle is longer, the ROI takes longer to realize, and so I can't get those impressive numbers as quickly with you as I can with, you know, Mosquito Joe's, the mosquito franchise that does pest control. I mean, we can get them money almost overnight. So my ideal customer for me is the one I can get the fastest ROI, and I serve other customers as well, um, but I don't target them. Another group that I target are agency owners, boutique agencies, PR agencies, communications, even marketing agencies. There are two ways they can make money with us. One is they can, we can use, they can use our services as a B2B marketer to get new customers for their service, for their agency. But two is they can upsell their existing customers with additional services. So for every one of my ideal customers, and I only have three, um, I have a very profound and specific value proposition that speaks directly to the agency owner, the home services person, et cetera. The other pro tip I wanted to give you is that it's not enough to just say, I want to find this type of person. That person needs to be findable based on psychographic or behavioral targeting criteria in Facebook or on Google. So for instance, if I sold socks, wouldn't it be awesome if I found people who had holes in their socks? The problem is those people are not findable online because they do not advertise the fact, they don't post to their Facebook group for people with holes in their socks about not having socks. Um, so, so you have to make sure that Facebook targeting is for audiences that are discoverable on Facebook. And I wanna um, show you exactly what I mean by this by the way that Megan targeted people who are aspiring writers. Um, and I, I see a couple of questions about B2B and coaching. And I think a little bit of what Megan talks to uh, might be helpful to you. And then I'll address your question head on. So Megan basically ghost writes books for rich people. And she's looking for the rich aspiring memoirist. Now the challenge with finding an aspiring memoirist is this is someone who wants to be a writer. They're not necessarily already a writer. So you can't use targeting criteria about being a writer because they're not a writer. They just want to be a writer. They're a wannabe writer. And there is no wannabe writer interest criteria. That's a hole in the sock. So what Megan figured out after she talked to a lot of her potential customers is that people who tend to love to write are people who tend, people who tend to want to write are people who tend to love to read. And it makes a lot of sense. So she said as part of her targeting criteria, that they have to really be into reading and then they need to be rich. And so here's what she found. You can see where it's the bottom of this. This is an actual screenshot of the targeting inside of Facebook that she targeted folks who uh, were fans of the website Goodreads, which is a social network for people who love books and who were subscribers to the New Yorker, which is a magazine. And she knew that those two targeting criteria we're going to help her identify aspiring writers. Now, there are a lot of people in there who are aspiring writers, uh, who are lo lovers of reading, who are not necessarily interested in writing. There's a little bit of noise in that category, but honestly, it's the best she could possibly hope to do uh, in order to uh, be able to get um, you know, good results from Facebook. And then of course, she wanted rich people, right? That goes without saying. So she uh, made sure that she had household income in the top 
of zip codes. Now, all of you can do this. All of you can do this. And we have a trick for that called the but no one else would trick. And this is a particularly useful trick for those of you who are B2B marketers. Uh, I sometimes get a question, you know, I'm a B2B marketer, I sell to other companies, shouldn't I just use LinkedIn and not Facebook? And why well, say, well, is your customer, is your ideal customer on Facebook? And they say, no, they're not. And I say, are you sure? Because 80% of people online are on Facebook. They might be sharing photos of their grandkids, but they are there. So the key is to create a campaign on Facebook that targets the right person and compels them to act. So the question is not, is my customer on Facebook? The question should be, how do I find them on Facebook and then create a compelling offer that'll compel them to act? And that's the answer that I would give to the B2B marketer who's doubting Facebook. You should also use LinkedIn. It's not an either or. LinkedIn gives you much better targeting criteria for professionals. It's just a lot more expensive and has a lot fewer eyeballs. Not only are there fewer members, only about 20 to 25% of the US populations on LinkedIn, but the average person, average person visits Facebook eight times a day. The average person visits LinkedIn two times a week. You pay for eyeballs, so you're gonna pay more for LinkedIn eyeballs and you're gonna get fewer eyeballs, even if you're in front of the right audience. So it's really a both end kind of thing for B2B marketers, definitely use LinkedIn. Now let's talk about this trick to help you find your ideal audience. There's a Goldilocks principle. There's an art and a science when it comes to finding your audience on Facebook. You don't want the audience to be too broad because you're gonna get a lot of false positives, but you don't want it to be too small that you've narrowed it down so much there are no eyeballs to reach. That's the uh, just right. Now, how do you find the just right point? So I wanted to do a quick thought experiment. I want you guys to imagine that you run a golf store where you sell golf equipment. What interest would you target, and please put this now in the chat, what interest would you target if you were trying to find a golf buyer and you were a golf store? Go ahead and try to put uh, some answers in the chat. So for instance, uh, Milu said a driving center, like a driving range. Uh, Tiger Woods, uh, thank you for that, Luis. Um, business and finance people. Uh, people who are looking for tips for putts. Pebble Beach, right, which is one of the great courses. Um, members of country clubs. Um, buyers of golf shoes. Uh, there are some really, really good ones in here, and there's some really, really bad ones in here. I'm going to start with the bad ones. So some of you said Tiger Woods. I've also heard people say people who like sports or the PGA. The problem with targeting Tiger Woods, and thank you everybody for those great um, uh, inputs. Andrea, you put PGA Tour fans right as I was saying that that was a bad answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, is the Tiger and the PGA are too broad. Tiger Woods is a celebrity. He's also a golfer. Every golfer loves and follows Tiger Woods, but there are a ton of people who follow Tiger Woods because they're interested in seeing if he's going to get drunk and get arrested again, right? Or they're wondering whether his um, recovery from his back surgeries is going to succeed. They're they're not golfers, they're just sports fans or people who like People Magazine, they're gossip hounds. Tiger Woods will give you too many people and it will waste your money, that's too broad. So instead of Tiger Woods, go with Bubba Watson. Do any of you, and put this in the chat, know who the hell Bubba Watson is? Before I learned about this, I had no idea who Bubba Watson is and that's a good thing. And the reason why is because Bubba Watson is a golfer's golfer. He's famous for his trick shots. And I can pretty much get bet that Annette, Melissa, um, I don't know what Pato Cabrera means. Oh, that's maybe another golfer. Ruth Ann, uh, Michael Silva, he said he's left-handed. Are you guys who are saying yes? Pato Silva is an Argentine golfer. Uh, are those of you who said yes, are you guys golfers? I'm curious. Um, what, 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 what I have experienced is that uh, folks who are golfers tend to know who Bubba Watson is, and people who don't uh, tend to um, uh, tend to not know who he is. Interestingly, Annette Malkin is the exception to the rule. Um, Brittany's dad is a golfer. I was going to say if your husband or a spouse or dad is a golfer, you might know who Bubba is. Uh, we actually have Melissa who worked 
uh, works at uh, Pebble Beach, uh, which is amazing. So most people who know who Bubba Watson is either are a golfer or have a golfer in their life. And those are your people if you sell golf equipment right? Because if your dad is a golfer, then you're going to maybe want to buy him golf equipment for his birthday. That's like an easy go-to. So Bubba Watson is an awesome targeting. There are a lot of people who know Bubba and most of them would be interested in what you sell. You need to figure out who your Bubba is, especially if you're in the B2B space. And so the way to do that is what I call the, but no one else would trick. And I got this from Digital Marketer. It's a great, great trick. A golf enthusiast will know who Bubba Watson is, but no one else would. So I want you guys to think about who is your Bubba Watson for your industry. Because we're uh, time constrained, we're not going to get a chance to do this. But please, like, take a screenshot of this. You know, look at this slide uh, when you get these slides. Figure out who your Bubba Watson is. It will unlock the power of digital marketing for you and marketing in general. Now, there's this very cool tool in Facebook called Audience Insights where you can test and play with who your Bubba is. The way you get there is you go into Business Manager, and I'm going to blast through this, but you're going to get the slides, and you click on Audience Insights. They recently changed where it was located, so this is actually the new uh, user interface. You'll see that you have to click everybody on Facebook, and then it allows you to target different people. So for instance, if you're a pet shop owner and you want to target Chihuahua lovers, you can see that they tend to be older. If you want to target um, Rottweiler lovers, you can see they tend to be younger. If you want to target Chihuahua lovers, they tend to love the uh, Facebook page Norbert. That's Norbert, how cute. If they're Rottweiler lovers, they tend to love the Facebook page Psychotic. That's Psychotic. Both of them are your customers, right? You run a pet shop. You have Rottweiler customers and you have Chihuahua customers. But this is to show you that you have to know who your segments are and your target audiences are. Because if you're stupid enough to try to talk to Chihuahua owners uh, in a Rottweiler kind of way or Rottweiler owners in a Chihuahua way, it is not going to work. <laughs> Melissa asked about corgis. Very good. That'll, I'll add that to the next presentation. Um, there's a really cool book that talks about how this insight about the Bubba flipped the presidential election in Donald Trump's favor. Uh, the book's called Mind Fucked, um, and there's an article there uh, where it talks about how they basically were able to figure out that people who like Adam Sandler movies are much more likely to vote for Donald Trump. And the reason why is because Adam Sandler movies are very gender normative. They should, like, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl again. And so if you're someone who's on the alt-right or very conservative and you like, and, you know, everybody likes funny movies, you're going to tend to like Adam Sandler movies more than the average person. And they were able to take something as crazy as liking Adam Sandler movies and associate it, along with a cluster of other things, with the likelihood to vote for Donald Trump. And this is honestly one of the big reasons they won the election. They were better at finding their ideal target audience and finding and then targeting them with uh, paid advertising on Facebook. Now, it's not just enough to know the objective and to find the, uh, find the um, audience. You now need to give them a compelling offer. This is called your irresistible offer. And the irresistible offer happens at the core of your business, right? This is your overall customer value proposition. Right? So as I said, this is not just about Facebook ads, but about digital marketing. You need to identify what your business's irresistible offer is. At BizHack, our irresistible offer is that people who take our five-week course pay for the tuition of the course through incremental revenue within six months of taking it. Ours is literally a course that pays for itself. That is an irresistible offer because you're learning something and the course pays for itself, you'd be a dummy not to take it, right? That's the idea behind BizHack's irresistible offer. Now, you can't start with an irresistible offer on a Facebook ad, and so you start the Facebook ad with a free irresistible offer. This webinar is our free irresistible offer. I am giving you a, a sneak peek into the core of our methodology. The things that we break out over the course of five weeks and five milestone assignments and a workbook and all this support and labs, you're getting the nut of it. 
right now. It is free, but people have paid upwards of $150 for this. And if you can give something for free that you know people would pay for, which this is, then you know you have a good free irresistible offer. So that's how BizHack is taking the, um, the uh, offer pillar and manifesting it in what you're experiencing in real time with me right now. Megan's offer was a free 30 minute consultation. For many of you who sell your time or sell consulting services, this is a great offer. The one key I would say that made Megan very successful is they can't think it's a sales call. Right? They really need to think that you're there to answer their questions. And so you'll see that Megan talked about how she's going to answer their questions about traditional publishing versus self-publishing. If you have more money than God, which these rich aspiring memoirists do, you can self-publish. It's not a matter of money, but they want to know whether they should. And that's what Megan uh, offered to answer for them. And that's really valuable to them. Next is the creative. And when we talk about creative in the context of Facebook and really online, we talk about video. It is critical that you advertise on Facebook and in many other platforms using videos. The problem is the videos are really short. And if you're not good at making video or don't have a videographer, they can be really expensive to make, right? Wrong. Facebook has built inside of its platform a video creation kit that allows you to upload your own photos or short video clips or use stock images that they provide for you and stitch together in 30 minutes a video. And I strongly recommend you not pay anyone to make these videos for you. I'm telling you, we do an in-class exercise that within 30 minutes, people who have a bunch of photographs are able to create a video that they can then use for the ad. And the ad video doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough to test to see if the audience responds. A lot of time, it's the, the bad videos that do best. And Megan did just this. She spent 30 minutes, she made a video, and it accompanied her ad. Creative Hub is a great tool. It's another free tool that Facebook offers that allows you to create your ads. Um, and there is um, how you get to Creative Hub in Business Manager. Finally, uh, the message. Um, the message is the words that accompany the offer, the call to action, and the, um, the video. And so you really want to focus in your messaging on your unique selling proposition. What is it that you provide that's so valuable to your customers? Um, and so uh, there isn't a lot of text in a, a Facebook ad. You can see, for instance, right here that um, the Facebook ad has just 14 words that Megan made. And you're gonna see how powerful uh, those 14 words could be. So here is Megan's ad. You can see the words uh, on the, on the very, very short uh, text on the uh, ad. It led to a, a landing page, a, a Facebook lead form where she offered the free consultation and invited people to share their contact information. And then these are the results and remember, the results are measured by bottom line success. How much did she spend on the ad? How much money did she make? She spent $429 on the ad. She ended up generating seven sales, seven, uh, 13 people filled out the form, seven of them became clients, $105,000 in incremental revenue with a 244X return on her ad spend. Really, really extraordinary results. And Megan talked about how in just three months, she built an online platform from scratch, launched a marketing campaign, and got enough clients to keep her busy through the next year. I gained the power to schedule my time on my terms and to choose which projects I want to work on. That freedom of choice is priceless. And that is my mission at BizHack, is to give you that freedom of choice and to transform your career and your life by giving you the power to generate online leads and sales through your special sauce, through your expertise, through your content. I do not think that digital marketing is, an, is, is optional for any of you. The small business, uh, the face, uh, a recent survey of small businesses said that over the next six months, the average small business is gonna see 63% of their revenues return. That means that they're gonna lose 37%, one third of their business because of COVID-19. The way to solve for that is to, do, to learn digital marketing, to master digital. 
It's the way that you can start to sell to strangers, people that you don't currently know who aren't in your network. It's much more scalable than nose to nose, um, face to face uh, marketing, which is what many, many small businesses rely, I think, too much on. You don't want to outsource your growth engine. You need to know marketing in order to be able to hire the right person and manage them successfully. I hope I've already taught you that if you don't know what your campaign objective is, you might very well judge people badly for a campaign that was actually a success. Every business needs a multi-channel approach. If you rely on referrals, awesome. If you rely on your friends and family network, awesome. If you rely on in-person networking, awesome. It's not enough, right? You got to get to Facebook. You got to get to Instagram. You got to use your website better. You have to have what's called a multi-channel approach. The reason why is because as we learned with COVID, any one of those channels could shut down overnight and you need to be ready to pivot. Email is critical. Finally, audience and offer the keys to success and nobody but the business owner understands that if you hire a kid or an agency to figure out who your audience is they're gonna screw it up i promise you you need to at least be able to help them figure out who your target audience is by articulating it to them and then coming up with an offer that you know will motivate that audience to click to become a lead to give you their contact information you cannot outsource that and you need to know enough in order to be able to be able to give that guidance. And that's why BizHack is in business is because we give business owners those tools. I want to quickly go through three tips about how to market during COVID-19. I want you to understand that customer behavior has changed fundamentally and forever. Your marketing must too. Probably don't need to uh, dwell on this one because you wouldn't be here if you didn't feel that way. Number two, many of you are reopening. Tell actively, aggressively your we are open story. If you have a Google My Business, you can actually put as the headline, we are open. On your uh, title tag for your website, put we are open. We are seeing massive increases in conversion rates from websites and Google My Business through this simple technique. People don't know that you're open, tell them. Tell them in every way you possibly can. And three, now is the moment. Dust off those plans. Eleanor. You talked about how you've been always planning to pivot to digital. There's no better moment than now. Do it now. Whether you do it with me, you do it on your own, you hire someone to help you, don't put this off anymore. This is not the future, this is the present. And the present, if you're not there, the past is gonna recede into the back uh, rear view mirror. There are a bunch of great resources that Google and Facebook offer. These are all inside of the, um, uh, PowerPoint that you're all going to get. And as a bonus, I would also recommend if you have a software company that you work with, ask them to give you a discount for COVID-19. All of them will. So say, look, I'm a struggling small business. Can you give me a break on my bill? And they will. And it's a way for you to save money. It's a little uh, pro tip. So before finally, go, I wanna, okay, go ahead, Lilia. Before you go, will you discuss Facebook pricing and what factors affect Facebook ad pricing? Absolutely. Facebook. So the factors that affect Facebook, thank you for the question. The factor that affects Facebook ad pricing is the number of advertisers and the number of eyeballs. It's an auction. Google is an auction too. Facebook is an auction. It's a little less obviously one, but because um, there are, as I said, are a lot more eyeballs and a lot fewer advertisers, Facebook ad prices therefore have gone down. Facebook is also a very cheap platform for many businesses especially if you have a very targeted audience compared to Google, compared to LinkedIn, compared to Yelp, compared to almost any other platform. Now, the reason why is partly because it's, you know, the Facebook is good for the start of an, a journey. They're good for awareness. They're not as good for conversion. Google ads are better for converting people because they show a lot of intentionality. Like if you said, who's the best lawyer for a car crash in Miami, you're someone who got in a car crash and you're going to need to buy uh, illegal services. That ad word right there could cost $70, $80 a click. But Facebook is, they're earlier in the funnel, but they are, and they're cheaper to reach, but they can definitely convert into customers. So one of the other reasons we love advocating Facebook is a place to start and learn is because you spend less money. And the cheapest ad objective is the video views objective. Lilia, were there any other questions? 
Yes, I know we ran out of time. It's already two, I can believe it. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one uh, regarding Megan's uh, case study, over what time of period did she spend, did she spend that amount? Um, for businesses that have to navigate protected classes, what are your recommendations for Facebook ads? Uh, what about if you want to sell a service to a restaurant owner? And uh, um, if, you don't, if you're new and you don't have the initial data when you're promoting your irresistible offer, what's your recommendation on that? Right, that's a great set of questions. What we're gonna do so that we can end on time is I wanna talk quickly about the scholarship uh, and then we'll wrap up and then I can stay around for a few minutes and answer some of those questions. Again, you guys are gonna get uh, these slides um, so you can review everything that's in here. There'll be a follow-up email. So I just wanted to let you know that on June 29th, we're starting our five-week accelerated course. Uh, Sheila Quinlan, uh, thank you so much for the testimonial. We have a number of people who are in that uh, course. Julie Speckler, uh, who's gone through it. Uh, Wendy Poe, uh, thank you guys for the testimonials. Uh, and, and it's been awesome working with you this semester. It starts again in a couple of weeks. Um, we specialize in getting you results. So last year, 100 businesses went through the program. They spent $17,000 in ads and made more than half a million dollars in revenue. That's an ROI of 29 to one. And as I said, the course paid for itself. And the way we do this is we have a very specific methodology. And I just showed you that methodology of the five pillars and then walking you through step-by-step on step how to apply them to your own business with one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, live lessons, and peer support. That's the science of how we do it. And the love is the supportive environment we create with you, your peers and coaches to help you get through it. We cover a lot of topics, but we really dive deep in the doing on the Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger ads, as well as LinkedIn. So we're giving you the full range of what you need to know and then diving deep as a learning exercise into Facebook. The core of the experience is one-on-one -on -one coaching on your real life campaign. So we require you, uh, it's by application only, and you have to spend at least $100 on a real life campaign in order to be able to actually qualify for the class. And we do turn about half the people away who wanna be in it. And then finally, the scholarship program. Um, I really would invite you all to apply for the scholarship uh, if you are all interested in potentially using this course. Um, and Lily, if you could put the link back into the chat. Uh, the five-week accelerated program, uh, we have a $20,000 scholarship fund, first come, first serve, four MBEs, minority-owned business owners and professionals of color, um, really any protected class, women-owned owned business owners, um, you know, Blacks, Asians, Hispanics. This is an inclusive um, uh, scholarship for underrepresented and excluded minorities. Uh, basically, if you're like a white guy, I'm sorry. <laughs> the course still is a great fit, but the scholarship isn't. We're really trying to use this money to give people a leg up uh, and get them uh, included in the recovery such as it is, because one of the big things that COVID is doing is it's devastating small businesses, particularly small businesses run by entrepreneurs of color. And we're gonna do our small part to help correct that societal and systemic injustice. I, I'm so grateful to all of you guys for uh, being on this call, for taking the time to be with me, for the support that you have shown for BizHack uh, over the years and over the last couple of months. Um, I really appreciate all of you. And I just wanna say thank you. Stay safe as we reopen. Stay safe as you protest in favor of human rights uh, and equality and equal uh, justice. And um, please uh, be well, uh, stay safe, and grow your businesses, hopefully with us. Thank you again very much. I really appreciate you guys. Appreciate your time. I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, thank you, Eleanor. Great talking to you. I'm looking forward to talking to you uh, privately. Christina and Chung, Sharon, thank you guys. It's been great. Lily Garcia, Susan, thank you guys so much. It really means a lot to me that you're uh, posting me um, favorable messages. You can see I, I put my passion into this and I uh, really care a lot about helping you. Alexander, it's great to see you. I'm glad you came. Milu, uh, encantado verte. Uh, I'm, I'm an Argentine at heart, so it's great to see you uh, joining us from Buenos Aires. Andre, Zia, 
thank you. Thank you also to Yoel um, and to um, Kevin from uh, Screen Co. Uh, all of your amazing uh, friends and family and, and folks in your network who joined us today. Um, Lilia, uh, as promised, I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to answer some of the pending questions before we wrap up, and we'll wrap up in another uh, five minutes. Um, would you mind going ahead and just reading one question at a time and tell me the name of the person who asked it? Sure. Um, mm -mm. What about if you want to sell a service to a restaurant owner that was asked by Justo Vera? I don't know if he's still... Yeah, Justo, that's a great question. You know, <laughs> Uh, one of the people who are in our course right now is uh, Michelle Banesh. She runs Menu Men. Menu Men sells menus to restaurant owners. Um, Lilia, if if um, uh, if you can get the contact information for him, would you mind making an introduction to Michelle? Because um, there might be some great advice that she could give. So if you could Perfect. private message Lilia with your email address, we'll make a connection and then you can actually get it from the expert in the source. She's doing a great job of selling to businesses, to restaurant owners who are very uh, challenged right now and can give you some very specific guidance. What's the next question? Uh, for businesses that have to navigate protected classes, what are your recommendations for Facebook ads? Be very careful. Uh, Facebook has very strict ad guidelines, specifically in real estate, uh, nutritional supplements, all you have to do is Google Facebook ad guidelines and read them carefully. The last thing you want to do is get banned from Facebook because you step over a line that you didn't know was there. Next question. Um, over what period of time did Megan spend the amount uh, that she did on her, on her ads? Three weeks. So she ran an initial ad with a video and then she retargeted those folks, which is where the bulk of the money was spent. And over the course of three weeks, she was able to generate those leads and then close those sales. And uh, unless uh, there are some more questions in the chat, uh, we have here, uh, if you're new and you haven't run any ads and you're trying to figure out who your target audience is, how um, can you collect data uh, for the irresistible offer? Audience Insights is the best tool you have. It's a free tool in Facebook where you can collect incredible data about what the likes and interests are of your target audience. So if you remember, I know we went through it quickly, the Chihuahua owner really loves Norbert. So that gives you a sense of the kinds of products and services that the Norbert, uh, that the Chihuahua owner loves. Now you can then offer that as a, free, a freebie if they sign up for your services. So let's just say the lover of Chihuahuas really likes pink hair bows. So you can, as part of your product or service, give the Chihuahua owner a free pink bow for every time they, you know, for, for if, if they sign up. That's an example of how you can leverage associated interests, which Audience Insights shows you, the other things that someone with that interest likes. And it's a very powerful way to generate really creative offers. It also helps you understand who your ideal partners might be, which restaurants you should use, et cetera. Next question. I don't think I have more questions for you. Great. Um, Mercedes, thank you from ScreenCo. I really appreciate it. Well, guys, thank you for sticking around for an extra few minutes. Uh, I really hope that you apply for the scholarship. Um, I do uh, encourage you, if you're not sure, if you, uh, if you qualify to go ahead and apply. Um, and we'll have an info session later this week and we'll answer any questions you might have. I really wanted to focus this presentation on giving maximum value and kind of revealing the BizHack methodology and how we get the results that we get. Uh, really appreciate Ross and Justo uh, and Eva and Javier. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you next week for our uh, graduation ceremony. If you wanna see case studies of what this learning does for businesses, come back in a week and you're gonna see some of the people who are on this call showing their stuff um, and, and sharing their learnings. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. And Christina, we're gonna send an email with all the links, all the stuff, the presentation, the live recording, the handout. Uh, you're gonna get everything you need from this. All right, be well, everybody. Thank you, Lilia. Uh, thanks for everyone. Bye, everybody.